Closed captioning for Justice and Law Weekly is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices in support of quality public television for the Chicago area. Welcome to the Chicago Bar Association's Justice and Law Weekly. I'm Aurora Astriaco, President of the Chicago Bar Association. My special guests today are the Honorable Thomas Gilbride, Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, and Jeff Coleman, a distinguished partner at the Chicago Law Firm of Jenner and Block and Chair of the Illinois Supreme Court's newly appointed Access to Justice Commission. Welcome, Justice Gilbride and Jeff. We really appreciate you being here today. Um, before we go into the commission that you appointed for Access to Justice, I'd like to um, maybe start with, um, can you describe how the Supreme Court is divided up and the structure of the Supreme Court? Not a lot of our viewers know sure. about the Supreme Court. <clears throat> well, first off, I'm delighted to be here with you, Aurora, and congratulations on your presidency of the Chicago Bar Association. Thank you, Justice um, The Illinois Supreme Court is the highest court in the state of Illinois. It's constitutionally mandated, authorized. There are seven justices of the Illinois Supreme Court elected by districts around the state of Illinois. Cook County, because of uh, population, uh, elects three Cook County justices, and the rest of the st state is divided up into four other districts. I happen to come from the uh, f uh, third district, so there's a total of five districts. Cook County is the first, and then on down the state, uh, from the north to the south is second, third, fourth, and, and fifth. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's uh, structured in a very rudimentary kind of way. Right. Now, how many Supreme Court justices are there? Well, there's a total of seven. Okay. Three from Cook and then four from the other four districts that make the total of, of seven. Okay, great, great. Now, uh, Chief Justice Gilbride, you started a commission on access to justice just this year. And as a matter of fact, Jeff Coleman is the appointed chair of that commission. Um, can you tell us about that commission and what what the purposes of that commission? Right. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure that I can take credit for starting it alone. It was an idea that was brought uh, to me by Bob Glaze from the Chicago Bar Foundation and, and Joe Daling with the Illinois Equal Justice Coalition, I believe is, is the name of uh, the uh, organization that Joe works with. Um, and uh, they made the proposal. We worked it up kind of vetted it in advance, the Illinois State Bar Association, the Illinois Judges Association, the Chicago Bar Association all endorsed the idea. Uh, and they brought it to me and then I took it to my colleagues. And, uh, and this year, just recently, we uh, actually, I think it was in the May term, when we decided to uh, authorize the establishment of the commission. And we appointed members and uh, under the rules uh, by the court, as the Chief Justice, I had the discretion to appoint one of those members as the chair. And uh, for better or for worse, I <laughs> selected uh, Jeff as our chair. And uh, he's a great chair, and uh, that's where we are right now. So we're, we're relatively brand new, as they say, not far off the, the parking lot. <laughs> right, right. Now, how many members of the commission are there today? There are 11 members, okay. according to the actual order creating the commission <clears throat> Five of the members must be judges, five must be lawyers, and one must be a lay person. So we have those 11 members from all over the state of Illinois. We have an extraordinary group of men and women who are committed to doing whatever we can to improve access to justice for everyone in the state. Right, and so let's go to the mission of the commission. Um, what is the goal and what is the mission and what do you hope to accomplish with the commission once it is done? Well, the, the, the rule, of course, speaks uh, precisely to, to the mission, but uh, I guess the shorthand version, this may not be as comprehensive or as full as I should, should uh, talk about, but basically is, is, is in the, the name of the commission, equal access to justice to make sure that individuals who find themselves in the court system are able to access the court system and to use the terminology that you hear these days, user-friendly kinds of ways. Right. And right. for people who are living us in court cases who are self-represented, meaning not mm -hmm. represented by a lawyer, uh, it's, it's arcane terminology and the whole concepts of procedures and so forth are foreign 
to a to a non-lawyer, and so uh, and w the last thing we want to do is take away jobs from lawyers. That's not right. the purpose here, but it's individuals who are in the lower income uh, category, uh, working folks that can't afford attorneys, uh, who have low wages and so forth that, that need access to the court system, whether they're uh, as an advocate, meaning bringing a case to court as a plaintiff, or if they find themselves being sued in a particular case. Right. And we see a lot more of the pro se litigants coming out there simply because of the economy and how hard it has been for a lot of folks. Um, so having said that, um, is this a one-year commission, or how long do you expect the commission to be? Well, I, I mean, Jeff can add some comments on this, but I, I think my view and the view of the court is this is a commission that's uh, long overdue. We are mm -hmm. one, uh, I think now Illinois becomes the 27th state in the, in the nation to establish a commission. The American Bar Association has uh, taken a position advocating or recommending to state Supreme Courts around the nation to adopt, establish these commissions, and we've established it. Our view is to, to be long-term, that it's uh, hope, hopefully... Uh, will be around for a long time to get things done. And, and we're still at the, the concept phase right. of, of the idea. And uh, I have to commend uh, uh, Jeff as the chairman. He's a, he's a real taskmaster, uh, nuts and bolts kind of guy, and that's why we picked him as chair. And we wanna, we're in the stage of, of uh, dividing up various tasks. And there are four committees, and, and uh, Jeff can certainly talk about those that have assign working objectives to get things done. So we're, we're going to move forward here right. rapidly. Okay. Now, Jeff, there are four committees. Do you know, can you tell us what those committees sure. are? Sure. And Aurora, <clears throat> I agree with what Chief Justice Kilbride just said. If, if the goal here is to really provide meaningful access to justice for everyone in the state of Illinois, mm -hmm this commission's going to exist for longer than any of us will ever be around mm -hmm. because it, it, it's a goal that may, it's likely unattainable for everyone, but, but that doesn't mean you don't strive to do it. Mm -hmm. So we've set up, uh, we've been in existence for a month, and we've got four committees in place. One is designed to investigate carefully and propose propose standard forms for litigants in basic kinds of cases. And it may, it may be surprising to you, I think I might have mentioned this to you earlier today when we spoke, but Illinois and Mississippi are the only two states in the country right now that do not have statewide standardized forms for things like uncontested divorces where there are no custody issues and a limited amount of money at stake. Mm -hmm. For small claims courts, that doesn't mean there aren't forms in Livingston County and Cook County and Sangamon County and St. Clair County. Most counties have forms, but there's been no effort made to make them statewide standardized forms. And these are very important for pro se litigants to be able to understand what they need to file to access the courts. Second committee is on language access issues, particularly in this economy, but before the recent problems, uh, people from all kinds of language backgrounds have had difficulty accessing our courts. I talked to a judge last week who has a mortgage foreclosure call and she was telling me that every day she has people who speak only Polish or pr predominantly Polish or Spanish or uh, Chinese. And we need to make sure that these people understand what is happening to them when someone is threatening to take away their home. Mm -hmm. So there is a language access committee. The third committee is something that other state commissions have done. And it's designed to put together a training program for courtroom personnel, clerks, bailiffs, judges, mm -hmm. on how to work with unrepresented individuals. And, it, and there's a big tension there, as I, I know you yes. realize, and that is that the judge and the clerks and the bailiffs have an absolute obligation to be impartial, to not be practicing law, 
to not be give, giving legal advice to one party as opposed to another on the one hand. And on the other hand, there is an obligation that every judge who I've ever spoken to feels to make sure that the participants in the process understand what's happening. So that will be the third committee. And the fourth one is we hope to be scheduling a conference on access to justice for the fall where we will be bringing in uh, people from legal aid organizations, from governmental entities to talk to us, to the commission and hopefully to the court as well about the needs and possible solutions. Yeah, and those are actually great <coughs> committees that you had indicated. I kind of want to go back to the language mm -hmm. barrier because as we all know a lot of um, the pro se litigants that we have there come from you know the minority communities the underserved population and yes you know a lot of them are immigrants who have difficulties you know speaking so how do you choose what languages are you gonna cover every single language or are you gonna concentrate on particular larger population um, languages I think that's it's, still to be seen. Yeah, yeah. And what we're going to try to strive for is to make the justice system as accessible to everyone as we can. We all know that money is a major issue in anything, almost anything you talk about. And so we're going to come up with the best possible proposals that we can, and we will have to consider financial restraints as we do that. Right, right. Um, I know on several, mm -hmm. you know, projects, and we're all involved in boards or projects, um, there are a lot of volunteer attorneys out there from different ethnic groups who could actually volunteer in terms of translating. Um, is the thought then to standardize the forms so that if I were a pro se litigant, I know what form, and it's one form, whether I'm in Cook, Lake, DuPage, whatever, correct? Um, so if that's the case, then we would want those forms translated into those various languages. Well, it, it's a very uh, complicated area. And as Jeff said, it's, uh, I forget the phrase you used, but in my mind, it's a work in progress because right. we're at the infancy stage of the entire commission and this particular goal of language on access uh, to the courts. And as you know, uh, the Asian community alone, there's 40 plus mm -hmm. some countries that, yeah. are, that are defined within the scope of what might be an Asian country which means there's you know 40 plus different languages. And then within a, a country, you might have several dialects within a right. language. Uh, so it's very complicated. And you know the, the other problem is Cook County, and this is not a problem or a criticism, but Cook County has a whole host of, of language issues here that don't exist in many other counties around the country. Uh, uh, and, and on a daily basis in Cook County, as I understand it, they have full-time staff right now for, for Spanish interpreters and Polish interpreters. There's certainly a need for additional interpreters, but then we come back to what Jeff said, is how do you, how do you pay the piper on all this and where does the, the money come from? And the federal government <clears throat> is also getting into, the, into this whole mix. There's certain uh, statutory provisions with federal funding that require that there's language access, not just physical access for those with disability challenges, but, but uh, language access. And then the question is, uh, if you take your idea, and it's a good idea, about having lawyers who speak second languages to help translate, you have legal issues of, of who, who qualifies mm -hmm. to be certified to actually right. translate in a court proceeding to make sure it's a valid uh, translation. So uh, the devil's always in the yeah. details, and uh, so it's never as easy as it might seem, but uh, we're, we're going to work at it and see what we come up with. It is, it is a great start, though. I mean, it's, it's much needed, and it's, long, it's a long time coming. Um, I was going to add to something that Chief Justice Kilbride said. We have extraordinary resources in our legal community, extraordinary. And the, the great, great, great majority of judges, lawyers, academics care deeply about access to justice. In the five or six weeks that this commission has now been in existence, we've received emails and phone calls from judges, retired judges, 
elderly lawyers who have retired from their practice but who want to make a contribution in this area. We know, regrettably, that there are hundreds and hundreds of unemployed young lawyers coming out of law school who cannot find jobs in the legal community. And all of those resources are things that the commission's going to consider to see what kinds of ideas we can come up with to take advantage of the resources that are available and, and open up the, the access to justice that we all want to do. Right, and, and that's a very good point. I didn't mm -hmm. even think about you know, the unemployed you know, young lawyers out there and retired lawyers who still want to do something, <laughs> right? Um, sure. But are there um, commissions like this in other states? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think we become the 27th. Okay. And <clears throat> uh, t tomorrow, for example, not to get into any great details, but uh, there's a retired state Supreme Court uh, justice uh, from New Hampshire that, uh, that Jeff has arranged a telephone call that we're going to visit with tomorrow to get ideas from, uh, from him on what they've done elsewhere. Next week in St. Louis, there's a national conference of state Supreme Court chief justices. I'm attending that. Uh, one of my personal goals and objectives is to try and uh, and mine the field, so to speak, to get as many ideas from the other state supreme courts. And I do know that through the National Organization of State Courts, it's called the National Center for State Courts, uh, they have a, a, a working committee of uh, commissions, access to, to justice commissions, so we're going to tap into that. And as you know, the American Bar Association's uh, national conventions coming up shortly here in Chicago and there's going to be a, a, a gathering of uh, access to justice commission I'm, I'm told anyway trying to get all the details I don't know this is sort of a work in progress right here right now Jeff but uh, we need to track that down and, and make a contact and network with those folks to get better concrete ideas A to Z how to get it done on the street so to speak right we're also here, Aurora, because we need you. <laughs> well, we, you know, here you invited you. us to be here, but <laughs> we know that the Chicago Bar Association, the Illinois State Bar Association, <clears throat> bar associations around the state are completely committed to the fundamental notion of doing whatever we can to improve access to justice. So we're here to ask you <laughs> to help us. And we are here. The Chicago Bar Association is definitely here to provide whatever assistance we can to make sure that this commission actually is mm -hmm. a successful commission. And you know, long term, yes, I do agree that it could be a long term because mm -hmm. of you know, the problem that we have on access to justice. And I guess the other question I have is, is there a perception out there, do you think, from the public that the court system is not accessible to the public? Um, you know, um, and I guess that ties in with, you know, do they feel comfortable when they show up in court or that they feel um, you know, overwhelmed um, because there's not enough pro se help mm -hmm. that's available to them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think the fact that you asked the question sort of begs the answer that uh, yes, <laughs> there are many people who don't feel comfortable going to court. I think the working uh, uh, terminology, or, or not term or terminology, but the uh, view is that uh, there's probably only two times people go to the courthouse that they're, they look forward to, and that's an adoption proceeding and, okay. uh, and, and a wedding proceeding. Uh, absent that, most people would prefer not to be in the courtroom or in the courthouse. Uh, it's, it's a, as I said earlier, a foreign a concept, a foreign language, legal technical language to people who are not trained in the law. So it's, it's a very uninviting kind of place because it's conflict, that's, right. uh, that's where conflict in our civilized society is resolved is in the courthouse. And uh, so I think there's a wide perception by many people that the courts are not as accessible as they should be. Uh, but to some degree, that's just the way it's, it is. But, uh, but on the other hand, we want to try and move forward as best we can to, to make it more accessible. And right. Jeff may have other thoughts on that as well. I completely agree. And you know, the last few weeks, we've all been talking so much about the United States Supreme Court's decision on the Affordable Care Act. Right. And a lot of times what you see in the media are discussions about decisions by the Illinois Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court, which have tremendous impacts on people. Mm -hmm. But I think the public's perceptions of how justice functions are really governed by what they experience in traffic court, in small claims court, 
in domestic relations court, in housing court, and that's not to take away anything from the extraordinary work that Chief Justice Kilbride and his colleagues and other judges of the higher courts of the states <clears throat> do, but I think our commission is going to be looking much more at what can be done in traffic court, right. what can be done in housing court, what can be done in some of these other courts where tens and tens of thousands of people experience them every year. Right, right. It's also with mortgage foreclosure. Yes, right? mm -hmm. very like, much. It's almost like everyone, someone we know at least, sure. is definitely going through a mortgage foreclosure of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the, the other question that I have is in addition to the financial um, constraint that you have, mm -hmm. are there any other obstacles that you could think of that you would have to tackle to overcome? Well, let me uh, answer that by throwing out one other thought here that I don't want to forget to mention. When you say financial, uh, I want your viewers to know that this is not a taxpayer-funded organization. Very uh, good point. We're not, we're not uh, tapping the lawyers on registration fees for this. This is a completely 100% a voluntary uh, commission-membered organization. Um, the Chicago Bar Association and the Illinois uh, Equal Justice Coalition are providing in-kind labor to use that phrase, uh, donated uh, assist staff time to help us uh, work this through. And we've got a marvelous group of commission members who are working uh, very hard on this uh, as, as part of their professional commitment as lawyers and judges uh, to do this work. And we've all also gone beyond the, uh, the 11 commission members because the rules allow the commission to bring in other folks. And we have, I think you know Judge Laura Liu, for example. Oh, yes. Judge yeah. Grace Dickler, who are both uh, have uh, uh, English as their second language. I'm, I'm not positive about Grace Stickler's background, but, but both of yeah. them are, have more than one language capabilities, and uh, they're going to be involved in this language uh, uh, committee, for example. So we've got all those folks doing this gratis, right. and, and that's, that's a tremendous uh, aspect of this. As far as the other obstacles, I think one obstacle uh, that we have to somehow resolve the tension on is, as we know as lawyers, at least in Illinois, our state takes the view that a pro se meaning unrepresented or self-represented uh, litigant, is technically held to the same standards as a lawyer when it comes, when you look at the case law on uh, procedures, and, and we're not, you know, the commission can't change that, but it's how we meld those uh, concepts together. That's uh, certainly uh, an issue along with the example that Jeff gave earlier about uh, court personnel not <clears throat> crossing the line and stepping in to represent anyone that they can't, but at the same time, to help people not get lost right. uh, in the courthouse, in, in, in the well of the courthouse, wherever it may be, uh, on whatever matter they're there for. So uh, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on obstacles. Well, one of the things we're going to explore is getting more and more volunteer attorneys to take on pro bono work right. and to represent individuals who can't afford it. And one of our commission members, the chief judge up in McHenry County, uh, Judge Sullivan noted to us last week that they've tried to put together programs up there and an issue becomes malpractice insurance. And some, you know, there are many clients, whether they are the wealthiest people in our community or the poorest, who are very easy to love and get along <laughs> yeah. with. And there are others where the attorney-client relationship can be difficult. Right. And if things don't go right, there are some clients from whatever backgrounds, from all backgrounds, who will immediately start pointing their finger at the lawyer and say, it's your fault that I'm now in this predicament. And it oftentimes is not. And so that's going to be an obstacle, how we can encourage people, especially in downstate communities, to get involved in pro bono work. This is a statewide commission. and. We are going to do everything we can to make the work product of this commission open to the processes down in southern Illinois and in western Illinois and to really try to improve access to justice. But when you ask about obstacles, the attorney-client relationship can be fraught with obstacles. Right, right, right. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. Pro bono for lawyers mm -hmm. is one of the main I believe obligations that lawyers have to do 
and I have to give back to the legal community. So in terms of, you know, partnership with mm -hmm. the Chicago Bar Association, you know, whatever we can do to go ahead and get out there, get the word out, whatever the outcome of the commission, whatever, are you planning on mm -hmm. issuing a white paper at the end? Um, for the result of, you know, I know it's very early on, um, and I know it's a work in mm -hmm. progress. Um, and maybe the thing to do is do a follow-up interview, right, next year, <laughs> yeah, yeah. to go ahead yeah. and uh, get out the word yeah. on sure. what the commission yeah. has come up with. Right. Well, you know, one one thought here to share with your viewers, at least uh, on the whole idea of pro bono, uh, to recruit, to encourage lawyers to try and and and. Uh, resolve this conflict that, that Jeff mentioned, that, that Judge Sullivan talked about. Uh, most, if not all, of the legal aid organizations that exist in the state of Illinois, if you, for example, agree to, uh, like with the Lawyers Assistance Foundation of Chicago, agree to do pro bono through their program, as I understand it, you would have malpractice coverage through them right. if the client is processed through however it's organized. And that's true with Prairie State Legal Services, it's true with uh, Land of Lincoln Legal Assistance in Southern Illinois, and I think it's true probably with almost every single aid, legal aid organization. So if it's structured, I think, the right way, where there's malpractice coverage through these legal aid providers and the attorney represents a client pro bono through that organization, right. then they have coverage. Right. That wouldn't, wouldn't tack on any liability to the individual lawyer's uh, own malpractice policy. Right, right, and, and even for that matter, those lawyers who are actually young lawyers who are not employed. Exactly. They don't have malpractice insurance, so this would be a way for them to get involved. That's so, great. Absolutely. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Justice Gilbert and Jeff, for discussing the Illinois Supreme Court's new Access to Justice Commission. I'm Aurora Astriaco. Thank you for watching the Chicago Bar Association's Justice and Law Weekly. Thank you. Wow. Closed captioning for Justice and Law Weekly is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices in support of quality public television for the Chicago area.